All right. Welcome to the show, Allie, also known as Grocery Getting Girl. For our audience who might not know you, can you introduce what you do, what your account is all about, what you focus on? Definitely. And thank you for having me, Carly. My account, Grocery Getting Girl, is focused on really helping people save money on groceries. I call it a food blog because it's comprehensive, but through different techniques of meal planning and grocery shopping, I really show people how they can stretch their dollar the furthest when it comes to food spend. Awesome. And so in addition to Instagram, you also just, you're releasing an ebook, right? What's that called? Correct. So it's just how to save on groceries. And it's a two part book. I've got a lot of information on a lot of different ways that you can approach saving on groceries. And then the second part is my 50 favorite recipes. Meal planning is a big part of my success. So I want to share kind of exactly what I'm doing and eating at home with everybody so they can, you know, use the same techniques and apply it to their lifestyle. Awesome. So before we dive into some of the details, just for context, for people listening, how many people are you feeding and what area of the U.S. do you live in as you're grocery shopping? So I have a family of four. I've got a 12-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old son. We live in San Diego County, which is one of the highest cost of living areas in the United States. Okay. I think that's really helpful for people to know because before I hit record, I was telling Allie, I live in one of the lowest cost of living areas, especially for groceries. Certain certain costs of ours are higher, but we very much live in farmland where dairy is very close to us. And so it really does drive down our overall food costs. And so I think it can be easy for people who live in more high cost of living areas to see what I'm doing and think, well, I don't have access to those prices. So you know, what she's recommending or the way that she's able to spend is just not applicable to me. So I'm excited to have you on because I watch your stuff and I'm like, we're doing some, a lot of the same principles, right? And so Mm -hmm. it can apply regardless of where we live. So I'm curious if you've always been this way or if there was a backstory to the reason that you needed to reduce your food spending. I have not always been this way. When I first became a new mom, I was working full time. Time was just so thin and it was so hard to do anything as far as planning ahead for anything, regardless of meals. My husband and I were never taught anything about finances by our parents. We were never taught not to use credit cards or specifically to pay them off if you use them. We didn't know a whole lot about credit and how to make that apply to your work in a realistic way. When we moved into our home, we put a new roof on our credit cards. Like Mm -hmm. we did not know what we were doing. We got ourselves in a decent amount of debt and we saw a financial planner who completely opened our eyes to the way that we were overspending and living way above our means. So we knew that we had to make a lot of big changes. And for me, the easiest way to do that was with the food spend. I started really taking a look at what I was spending and how I was spending it. And it made me sick to my stomach. I mean, we're talking 50 plus dollars a week on coffee, $150 a week eating lunch out between my husband and I. That's not even counting the times we got to eat dinner. Looking at the numbers, you're like, okay, I can really reduce this number, but it's going to take some work. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I did is started doing my homework and figuring out where I could get the cheapest food. And I would literally get cash back the amount that I was saving versus what I used to spend. I'd take that 50, 60 bucks, I'd save it at home, and I'd walk into the bank with $600 every month in cash simply from what I saved on my groceries. That was the only money I was putting towards it. And that helped us over five years pay off over $70,000 in debt. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, the food category is such a it's such a hard one because it's like we have to buy food. We can't just, you know, unlike a subscription or something where we could just say, okay, I'm just going to cancel this and go without while I'm focusing on my goals. We still have to buy food. But I do think it is an area that just with a little bit of time and shifting, you know, some of those habits, we can be really happily surprised by how much space we can find in our budget inside that one category. So it sounds like a lot of what the shifting was, was shifting away from eating out as much towards eating food that you got from home. Is that right? Correct. And really having a plan similar to when you first start budgeting and you really need a budget to control your money. We need a meal plan to control our food. When there's no plan every night, there's no way to really curb the spending. And it started out far and few between. I would plan two to three meals a week because that's what was doable for me as a young, working, busy mom. And from there, I was able to build upon it because once I started saving, it became really addicting and I found, you know, other ways to do it. But then it got to a point where 
I didn't just want a meal plan two days a week. I wanted to do it all week so I could save even more money. Yeah, I love that because I think when if somebody hasn't started the the task of meal planning and paying attention to their grocery spending, it can feel really daunting. And it can also you can project onto it the way you feel about it right now. So if right now I'm like, oh, that sounds terrible and it sounds like so much work. What we imagine then is that it's always going to feel that way, that it's always going to feel daunting, that it's always going to feel boring. But I love what you're saying that once you got started and once you started to see the tangible rewards for your efforts, it truly does become a lot easier because you're like, oh, I actually actually like this. Right. Like we can surprise ourselves. And be yeah. like, oh, it's not a chore as much as it was before, because now I can see why and I can see a tangible difference that's happening because I'm making that change. So just encouraging people to start, like give it a chance, give it, yeah. you know, give it an opportunity to see what kind of difference it can make is awesome. So I, I love that you said that you started with two or three meals a week, because I think a lot of people listening might feel hot or cold. Like I have to go from what I'm doing right now to not eating out at all and fully planning out, you know, seven meals a week. So when you started planning and you did two or three meals a week, how did you find a way to plan for meals that would fit into that busy schedule that wouldn't feel like you were spending your whole evening in the kitchen, for example? That's when I started to get into freezer meals because my days were stretched so thin that I found taking time to prep things on the weekend made a lot more sense. It was realistic, it was doable, and then the food would get eaten where I felt like if I had that food sitting in the fridge at home, there was always a risk that I was too tired and I'd just say, let's order pizza or whatever. So that that definitely helped of just kind of like slowly building it up in that aspect. And then also just keeping really easy, quick things on hand, keeping, you know, chicken in the fridge and you've got a bottle of teriyaki sauce on hand, a bag of frozen veggies and some rice. Throw together a teriyaki rice bowl. It does not have to be a masterpiece. It has to feed you. That's it. Yeah. I think a lot of times, especially for people who are cooking a lot at home right now, the only example they might be thinking of or comparing themselves to is like the Pinterest meal idea, right? Of like, it's going to be, you know, nine different pans are going to be going on your stove at the same time. And the ingredient list is 20 items long. And some of them you can't even find in a regular (laughs) grocery store. (laughs) And I think we create this idea that like to cook at home, it has to it has to look like a restaurant all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. And Mm -hmm. I, I know for myself, like once I got over and got to that point that you just described too, where it's like, it doesn't have to look pretty. It doesn't have to win any awards. It can just feed us well. And that, that can be the goal. I think it's such a, a burden off of your shoulders to realize Mm -hmm. like it can look, you know, like what you'd explain, like the, the bowl of teriyaki. I know sometimes I make something and I'm like, this looks like it came out of a ladle (laughs) in a school cafeteria in like the 1980s. Right. Like it's just kind of a brown bowl of goo basically. But a lot of times it tastes good. But I think when we can tell ourselves like it doesn't need to look Instagram worthy or Pinterest worthy in order to be a meal that gets the job done is so helpful to alleviate all of that pressure on ourselves. Right. So now yeah. that you've been doing it for a while, what's your approach now that you're not working, you're not working full time out of the home anymore, right, are you? Right, right. right. No, not at all. Mm-mm. Okay. So now what's your approach to that meal planning? Has it shifted now that you're not working out um, of the home as much or do you still lean on those freezer meal ideas? Well, it's interesting because when I worked full time, it was really, really busy at work and we didn't have a, a really busy social life with the kids because they were little. Now my work schedule is not as crazy, but with their sports, that aspect makes it really difficult to kind of plan. And so it's it kind of swapped the, the, the priorities of based on the kids' ages. I definitely plan around our schedule now. And that wasn't something that I did. So my kids have practice every Tuesday and Thursday night. That's pretty much always going to be a crock pot meal because mm-hmm. I know it's really, really hard to say that I'm going to get home from practice and say at 630, yes, I want to cook a full meal because yeah, there's many nights that I don't want to Dropping something in the crock pot at 8, 9 a.m. and then just letting it sit on warm has been such a lifesaver for me in so many different instances. But it's really, you know, when I do my meal planning at the end, at the beginning of the week, it's looking at everything we've got on the agenda and, you know, how can I execute this on a busy night? And then, okay, we've got nothing going on on Mondays and Wednesdays. So that's my night to be a little bit more creative in the kitchen because I do love to cook. Yeah. So to be able to try a new recipe here and there, I definitely plan around our busier schedule. Whereas before it was just trying to make it work outside of my personal busy schedule at work. 
Yeah. I feel like I'm like right at the beginning of that transition of like, I have littles, but I also have bigs yeah. who are getting into sports and stuff. And I think I, I think especially with putting something like in the crock pot or the instant pot and doing that ahead of time is so helpful because you make the decision at a time when you're actually able to make the decision. Yeah. So it's like when you get home from that busy basketball game on a Thursday night or whatever, and you're like, oh, I don't feel like cooking at all. And if you hadn't put something in the crock pot in the morning, you for sure would have ordered takeout or grabbed something in a drive through on the way home. But because you knew like it's already in the crock pot, it's going to be done when we get yeah. home, then you made the decision at a time when you weren't stressed, tired and busy. Yeah. And so then when you are, you're like, all right, I, I would have gone and gotten takeout right now, but I thankfully already stuck something in the crock pot at the beginning of the day and I don't even have to worry about it. Another thing I've found that I think fits into that crockpot thing too is when we talk about fast food, I like to tell people fast food is actually at home. Like the fast food that we can get on the table quickly actually tends to be the stuff that we can throw together at home and not, you know, for me, I don't live super close to a lot of takeout options. So I've timed it before and the amount of time it would take to drive to Chick-fil-A, wait in the drive through and drive home is longer than the time it would take me to toss some of my own chicken nuggets and fries into the oven and get them on a plate. So like the actual fast food tends to be at home and not out, even though it feels, you know, more convenient. So when it, so that's kind of the meal planning side, I think is finding meals that you actually want to eat. And then also fit with your life, like and don't have yeah. an idealistic version of like, oh, for sure, I'll be fine with spending 45 minutes over the stove right when I get home from work kind of thing. And instead, making sure that the meals you plan actually match the capacity that you have is super important. So now let's talk about then grocery shopping. So if you have that meal plan, what's your order of operations? Are you first looking at what's on sale and determining meals based on that? Or are you deciding a meal plan and then going and shopping for those ingredients? How do you prioritize which one comes first? Great question. I have never been traditionally a sales shopper. It's just never really been my type of thing because what I've found is a lot of times the things that are on sale aren't always things that we're eating regularly, things like pork chops or something like that. And so I find that if I'm buying it simply because it's on sale, it's less likely to get eaten by my kids or my family because it's not it's not like a chicken breast type meal that we're doing all the time. So I do kind of skip that area. However, I will say if I get there and there's something that I use often on sale, I will take it as an opportunity to stock up, especially if it's something that I can freeze on, take advantage of that sale price. Mm -hmm. And then on Fridays or Saturdays, I have a routine and it's very much become a routine to me. I can't go without this routine. It's a big part of my life. I sit down at my kitchen table and I start inventorying what I have in the fridge, what I have in the freezer, what I have in the pantry. And I start building my meals around that. These meals are going to be built based on my picky eater kids. These meals are going to be built based on something that I can pull together in 45 minutes or less. And so a lot of the things that I already have on hand, I can say, okay, I've got a jar of this salsa and I have chicken breast, grab some tortillas, and I've got a really easy taco night one night. And it's really just surveying what I have on hand to add as minimal of ingredients as possible to each meal. So we make, I make a lot of the foods that I know that my family is going to eat and I create a meal plan based on those meals. And I can, I have an estimated cost of what my groceries are going to be every week because for the most part, I'm buying a lot of the same things. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point too, is like if you can make it a consistent thing, then it's not like, one week you spend 140 and one week you spend 280. And so it's just, you can keep it within a known bubble and better budget yeah. for what you can expect to spend. And I think it's really helpful too, to hear you talk about the order of you first look at what you already have, right? Like the cheapest store is going to be your own pantry, your own mm -hmm. freezer. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of times we feel like we have to reinvent the wheel every week. Like we sit down and we have to come up with seven new things that we didn't eat last week, for example. That is not only mentally taxing because you're like trying to create stuff that you haven't done before, but it's also expensive because it's probably going to be, like you said, like totally different ingredients than it was last week. So you're talking about buying a different sauce and a different spice that you had and, a different, you know, all of those little things that really add up in the budget really quickly. So I, I think it's super helpful for someone who is just starting out to start with what their own inventory is, like to have a rhythm like mm -hmm. what you have and say, okay, are there, is there anything on hand that I don't have a plan for yet that Over I can put into the meal plan? Because like what you said with grabbing tortillas or whatever, if we can have 
the majority of the ingredients already at home. And so it just takes grabbing a bag of cheese and one vegetable to go on the side. Yeah. That means that for next week, it, you know, it was like $6 out of our grocery budget, but it created a full dinner for the whole family. So we want to come up with a meal plan that is realistic for our life, our energy, our schedule, and then look at what we already have in order to come up with a list of what we need to buy and minimize how many things we're buying. Now let's talk about actually going to the grocery store. Do you hop around to lots of different stores? Do you have like one store that's tried and true? How do you actually approach going out to the store? I will say being in a high cost of living area, that is one thing that I have in my favor is I have a lot of options closed. Yeah. I've got a Costco that's three miles. I've got a 15 minute drive to Sam's Club. I've got a 99 cent store close. And so that is something that really helps me being in a high cost of living area. And this is kind of the way that I do it. I shop at Food for Less. I have done so much research and so much price comparison. And I have found that overall Food for Less is my best bang for my buck. That mm -hmm. I can go there. I can pretty much get anything I need at a good price. And I try to do that as much as I can. However, I also supplement at stores like Costco and the 99 cent only store. And I go to different stores. But when I go, I make sure that I'm stocking up. So it's not a big time suck of me. And obviously Costco is in bulk. So everything you're getting there is going to last you quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll go to the 99 cent stores on days that I know they're having their delivery. So they've told me Tuesday is a bakery and Thursday is deli. I love their sourdough bread. It's $6 at my grocery store. They sell it for $1.49. So I go and I stock up. I get four or five loaves, put them in the freezer, and then I'll grab my turkey that I need, which is $2 there versus $6 at the grocery store. I buy every container they have. I've walked out of there with 15 containers before <laughs> because it will get used. Yeah. I freeze it. And by the time I keep it in my fridge, it's all used up by the time it would have gone bad. So I do hop around at stores. But I also make sure that it's not a time suck and I'm not going there for just one thing. I'm going there for the things I can specifically stock up on and then I won't go back for another six weeks or whatever. Awesome. I think that it's hard to sometimes come up with what the advantages are of living in a high cost of living area. It can it can be easy to only see the negative or the expensive or the downside. So I think that is really true because so, for example, like what you said, I live in a low cost of living area, but I have like less than five grocery store that I could access, yeah. right, without driving over 30 minutes away. So in my town, I have Aldi, Walmart, or Kroger are the only ones. And Kroger is much more expensive than Aldi or Walmart. And then I can go to Costco like 20 minutes away, 15, 20 minutes away. But that's that's pretty much it. Like there's there's a few variations of like schnooks and things like that. But the, we certainly don't have like the 99 cent store. I've never yeah. even heard of that until following you and seeing where you go. And so I think, you know, if people are living in a high cost of living area thinking, oh, because I live here, it's always going to be more expensive. I, I think what they can maybe take from you is that there's also when there's a dense population and there's also a lot of competition among grocery stores. And so that means that the options are there and sometimes you can find those uh, big deals. So let's go back to when you first started, because now you're kind yeah. of a pro at it and you're like, I, I know about how much I need to buy. Yeah. I know what my budget's going to be. When you first started, did you set a budget for yourself and then actually try to pay attention in the store to where you were at? Or did you just go ahead and grocery shop and figure out what the total ended up being after the fact? I watched my habits really closely for the first two months because I, I honestly didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't ever have any sort of budget set before. So this was a whole new ball game, And I was like, okay, so now I have to look at this with a completely different perspective. So I really watched my habits as a consumer for a solid eight weeks. So what I was buying on a regular basis, and this goes back to, I'm making the same meals for my family, like chicken breasts, ground beef tacos, that type of stuff. I was buying the same stuff at the store every week, my iced coffee. It was not a lot of different things. So after two months, I got a pretty good idea of what an average grocery shopping trip should cost without any impulse items, just exactly what is on the list. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's times where we have a camping trip or a holiday coming up and it's going to be over that and that's fine. But my budget is 150 because I know that that should get us everything we need every week with no extras. And mm -hmm. if there are a few extras here and there, that's fine because my budget is already low. So it's accounting for that. But for me, it was a lot of just watching what I was spending. And I think it's really hard to say, here's how you should set a budget, because like what you're saying, people live in such different cost of living areas. Mm -hmm. I've heard people say $100 per person per month. And in San Diego, I, I couldn't realistically feed my family yeah. on that. 
Yeah. So it was just for me, a lot of watching my habits and saying, okay, I spent $205 this week. That was a total overspend. I don't need to buy bottled water. I don't need to buy bread here when I can get it at the 99 cent store cheaper mm -hmm. and seeing, oh, I can do six trips that are 150. I can do this every week. I just have to be dedicated to it. I love that because I think when we first start out, one of two things can happen. People can either take a, it costs what it costs approach where they just go to the grocery store and it's like, well, because I bought yeah. that food, it must mean that we needed it. So there's that. But then if we account for food waste or like you said, the optional snacky beverage kind of things, it's actually a lot higher than it needs to be. Or when people decide I'm spending too much on food, they then create a limit for themselves that's super unrealistic, that's like really low, right? And so I had somebody just the other day, I posted about cost per person per day and calculating out that number because when we compare grocery store spending to restaurant spending, it's really easy to look at, well, when I walk out of the grocery store, it's $200. And when I walk out of McDonald's, it's $18. How is yeah. McDonald's? more expensive than the grocery store. But when we break it down into what are we actually getting for what we're buying, it becomes a much different number than that 200 total. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it can be hard to, I had, so somebody going back to what I was saying, somebody said, I've been really trying to get my grocery budget from, uh, I think it was from 150 a week to a hundred a week. And I asked her how many people are in her family and she has three little kids. And I was like, you know, if you break that down to cost per it. person per day, that's like $2.75 per person per day. That's probably just not going to happen anywhere, you know? So at a certain point, we kind of bottom out to like, like you said, like you're just not going to be able to eat for that amount. So I think at the beginning, it's really helpful to just say, I first want to just focus on awareness, just like paying attention to what my spending has been and what it currently is, and then really taking a hard look at how much of what I bought would I consider a necessity versus a treat or, you know, mm -hmm. something like that, and then be able to adjust from there instead of trying to whiplash from like, oh, you know, I had been spending 400 a week and that's too much. So I'm going to go down to 150 a week the following week, right? But stair-stepping ourselves down, you know, slowly mm -hmm. over time, I like to compete with myself. And I think that kind of helps too of like, yeah. okay, I did 220 last week. I bet I could do 210 this week, right? Yep. And if we make those changes more gradually, they can last. They can actually stick around instead mm -hmm. of trying to be too drastic all at once. And I feel like when it's too drastic all at once, it's really hard to stick with because it's yeah. a huge lifestyle change. Yep. And when when something feels too different too quickly, it's uncomfortable and it's, yeah. it just feels like it's like unsustainable. You're like, there's no way I could do this. But yeah. if you like what you said with the meal planning, if you just say, OK, I'm just going to start with meal planning two or three dinners a week and just do that until it feels comfortable. And then once that feels comfortable, now say, OK, now I could do four or five. Yeah. And and so we make those little steps that come more gradually and then they can actually stick around. If I think back to before I regularly cook dinner there, even though, like you said, I also like to cook, even when I did like to cook, if I tried to go from not meal planning at all to cooking five or six dinners a week, like I just wouldn't have done it. It, it would have been too much. OK, so grocery shopping. So you have lots of options. You have lots of stores. And so you can kind of pick and choose where you go and make sure that you get a price. Do you, how organized are you with this? Do you track, like, do you write down, this is where this thing is the cheapest? Or do you just kind of have it in your head over time with experience? It's crazy. I have it in my head and I don't want all this information in my head because I shouldn't know that Sam's Club is 50 cents more for like paper towels than Costco. But I guess it's just, I, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy finding ways that I can save. And I just kind of know this is more here. This is more here. I do always find new things. And I try to share that. Like I was always getting like the ranch shakers at Food for Less. And it's $9.99 for 20 ounces. I saw that Costco has it $9.99 for 35 ounces or something. So I'll share that with my audience, like little savings that I'll find like that. Because then I, I find it'll stick in my head more and I'll remember. I wish that I had this on some sort of piece of paper to get it out of my head, but it's all in my head. It's all in your head over time. Yeah. And how long have you been doing this? So for people who are like, oh my gosh, I could never hold this in my head. How, how much experience do you have where you got to the point where it's kind of just in your head? 2017 is when we saw the financial planner and I started implementing changes immediately then. So it's been quite, but it, 
it's grown exponentially, obviously. I didn't have this type of information when I first started, and I imagine it will grow even more in the future. For sure. So for people who are like, okay, even if I do this for a while, it's not going to be fun for me. I don't, I don't get enjoyment out of doing something like that. What would you say would be like the, if you could whittle it down to, you don't need to pay attention to if ranch is $9.99 here or here, what would be the heavy hitters where you're like, okay, if you could only pay attention to like two or three categories at the grocery store, what would you have people focus on if they're overwhelmed by all of it? Definitely your your overall spend, your total that you're spending. It's interesting. I just bought a Sam's Club card and I went yesterday and I compared a lot of prices to Costco. And I think if you came out with a, a haul there, they would be very, very similar. I know that if I go to my local bonds and I did a grocery haul, it's going to be at minimum $215. And that exact same haul will probably be about $140 at Food for Less, something like that. Mm -hmm. So basically paying attention to overall costs. But then if you're a sales shopper who has the best sales, I had asked recently for some tips. I want to do a reel on Sprouts, which is a health food store here mm -hmm. in California. And I was like, who can share their favorite Sprouts deals with me? I got nothing because there is nothing. It is mm -hmm. a more expensive store and you're going there for a different product. You're going there for a more holistic type of product and everything is going to be more expensive. So if you're okay with paying that, go there and supplement a few things there. Mm -hmm. But overall, I think as long as you're walking away with being in budget and your total spend, that's what's most important. And it, it takes some research to figure it out. I did a grocery haul at every local option that I had and compared prices on everything. And that's a cool thing to do. Like you, you only have to really do it once in mm -hmm. order to then understand yeah. and make that decision about like the stores that are available to me. Now I know which ones are going to consistently be the best. And I can just put it out of my mind that I have to like weigh each store every time. Like, do I want to go to this one or this one? If you do right. that once, then you know, this is what I have available and this is how I can stick on budget. So for yeah. stretching that budget and getting to like where you're at with like the 150 for four people in the San Diego area. What are some of the meals or ways that you've found to prep food that does help you stretch the budget and make that grocery go further? You know, we've mentioned dinners a few times, but what about like breakfast, lunch, snacks? Like how do you kind of stretch that budget as well? So again, I like to bake. I like to cook. And so every week I will bake up like a batch of muffins or more lately it's been more like a bread, like a peach bread or something like that because it's quick and easy. Um, I grow my own fruit and it cost me less than a dollar to make those types of meals. And I really like that I can control every ingredient that goes into it. I mm -hmm. look at the frozen waffles that I feed my son in the morning and there's a bunch of ingredients that I can't pronounce. So that is something that I do. I realize that that is not realistic for everybody and not everybody has the time to kind of bake their own things and approach it like that. I have very busy mornings and we, I never allow more than two minutes prep for any type of breakfast. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of instant oatmeal that we have on hand. We do have cereal for those mornings, frozen pancakes, frozen waffles, that type of things. Just kind of like get the kids out, like get them on their way. Same for my husband. He'll have like an English muffin, but just all really quick grab and go options. These are all things that I'm buying at Food for Less that are generic products. I'm not buying the Thomas's English muffin. I don't see a difference between the Kroger English muffin and the Thomas's, so I'm going to mm -hmm. save $2. Fill, you know, my cabinets with things that are easy options that are not super overpriced. And then lunches, we're really lucky. State of California offers free lunches to all kids in school. So my daughter buys lunch through school, but my son packs a lunch every day. And it's, the, you know, the same thing. I buy Lunchables on sale. They mm -hmm. just went on sale for 2 bucks each. So I stocked up, I think, about 20 But normally they're 3 bucks. I have the room for it. Again, mm -hmm. I've got an extra fridge and freezer. And if you have the room, that's great. I think that's that's really important too to when we have the storage space to take advantage of that, right? Like I yeah. just for the very first time got a a deep freezer in our basement nice. just like six months ago. And it is so helpful. Like just to like be in the store and to know. Like even with Costco, I, I've had a Costco membership for several years, but I tended to not buy chicken breast there because it was just so big. Like just it was so yeah. much at one time. You couldn't buy any less than like eight pounds at a time. And so now being able to like freeze that and then that is my go to as I meal planning as I go down and look in the deep freezer and see like what is already on hand. 
especially in weeks that I'm like, okay, I, you know, spent a lot last week. So I'm going to try to make my spending this week be lower Then I really rely on going through that stock in the deep freezer. So that's another thing I often say it with care creates contentment, but it's sometimes we need to spend a little to avoid spending a lot. And I think having like proper food storage can be one of those investment ideas, like purchasing the room to be able to take advantage mm -hmm. of some of those sales when they come around or just be able to buy in bulk if we want to, especially if we have bigger families, can really help drive down the overall spending, even if in, you know temporarily we're like, okay, well, it costs a lot to buy a deep freezer, but what yeah. could I then be able to do moving forward if I have access to some of that storage is really nice too. So speaking of the freezer, for freezer meals, if somebody wanted to get started on that, who is mm -hmm. like, okay, I am in the position that Allie was in seven years ago where I have one or two really small kids and I work full time. How would you recommend trying that out and seeing if it works? What's your approach to some of those freezer meals? Do you do like a bunch of them at a time? Do you do one or two per weekend? What would be the best way to start? To be honest, I, I loved the idea of starting a freezer stash. It was something I came across during pregnancy with my son, but it seemed really expensive. And mm -hmm. it was something that really, it, it was kind of scary to think yeah. about. So when I started building it, I did it a little bit differently. I buy my ground beef and my chicken in bulk because we use that a lot. But my local grocery store, and this is not the cheapest price grocery store that I shop at. This is a grocery store that's half a mile from my house. They're a little bit more expensive but they're great on their meat deals. And every morning they like move their stock and they'll discount these meats out. And so all of my more expensive cuts of meat, my tri-tips, my short ribs, my roasts, all of that, 100% comes from the meat markdowns. And this is basically something that they want to move off the shelf, but it is in no way bad, especially mm -hmm. if you freeze it. You usually have two more days from the day that they put the sell-by date on to at least freeze it. And as long as you freeze it, you're good. You can also eat it immediately. Yeah. That is how I have built up my freezer stash on a budget. And having those cuts of meat on hand is how I build every single meal with every single meal plan. But there's short ribs traditionally, like if you get them at that store when they're not on sale, you're going to be paying $25 for two pounds or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't plan the type of meats that I buy. And it's always kind of a crapshoot on what I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. But that's OK, because I go home and I jump on Google or Pinterest or what have you and figure out meals that I can make with that. One of the most amazing things I found there is a pork shoulder that's six pounds. They sell it for $13 once I prep it and everything. It's around 15. I'm in the process of making a reel on it now. We're going to pull our fourth meal out of it this week. Wow. $15 worth of meat. I, I was never a big pulled pork eater before, mm -hmm. but hey, $15 for four meals. I'll eat some pork. <laughs> I will eat some do pork. That. <laughs> I think being creative is really important with the ability to reduce your food spending of not feeling stuck into like, these are the six meals that we will eat and that's it. I think when you can stretch that creativity just a little bit, and I don't even mean coming up with meals on your own. I just mean thinking outside the box of like what you said with this was on sale. So I'm going to Google what can I make with tri-tips and see what it happens. I think one of the biggest things I end up doing in my DMs is just reminding people that Google is your best friend. You can even Google like, I have tri-tips and this kind of potato and this kind of sauce. Somebody has already made a recipe with those ingredients. We don't have to be the ones to invent it. We can just be the ones to be creative or like I said, think outside the box enough to be like, I wonder if there's something out there that we could make that would taste good for us. Because then we can reverse engineer it and say, well, because this is on sale, this is what we're going to make something with this week. And I think sometimes we actually do find things that we genuinely do like that we wouldn't have necessarily tried without going ahead and being a little bit uh, adventurous. And I say that with all the caution in the world, because I also have picky eaters. And so I know the idea of being adventurous with food is terrifying to them. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, if it's like, okay, we have these three safe foods that you're used to eating, yeah. and we're also going to try this one new thing, it can help them stretch it a little bit too. So I think having having a stash or having a freezer, whether it's just huts of meat that are in the freezer or even assembled freezer meals can be a really good first step. Because I think once you experience that moment where you're stressed and tired and don't want to do anything and you always would have gone out and you now have a different option. I think that's when you really start to turn a corner of like, 
oh, I see why this effort is helpful because I did a little bit of effort earlier. And now instead of feeling forced to eat out and grab takeout, now I have another option that fits better into my budget overall, which I think is is what everybody is trying to do, but can't always find the right way to do it, right? So when you're trying to balance spending the time and spending the money. A lot of the things that you're saying do take a lot of time, right? Like you're kind of trading off that you're spending less of your dollars, but it is requiring more of your time. And sometimes, like I know when I was a stay-at-home mom, the, the resource that I had available to me was the time and it wasn't the money. Like I couldn't spend a bunch of money on the convenience foods, but I could bake a batch of muffins or whatever. And other people have the flipped resources available to them. So for somebody who is trying to find that balance between how much time do I spend on this versus how much money do I save, are there any tasks that out of all the things that you do in order to reduce your groceries, you're like, this one is the most efficient? Or like you said, baking does take a lot of time and it does, you have the cleanup and all of that stuff. What would be the ones that you say, you know, if I can only keep two or three of these tasks that save me money, what would those big ones be for you? So bulk shopping is a really big one, not overspending when you're buying in bulk. And this comes back to, again, like the consumer habits of watching what you're spending. It took me years to dial in my Costco spending Mm. and figure out exactly what we need. And it's come down to a lot of shelf stable goods. I think that can be a area of gross overspending because kind of what you're saying is people walk in the grocery store and say, I need this. I have mm-hmm. to. Yes, you do. There are, These are things that you need. But do you need them in these quantities? Do mm-hmm. you need to spend $436 to feed your family? Or could you do that in a more realistic way? So mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that's first, but it's very, very important if you're a bulk shopper to yeah. dial in only what you use in bulk because mm-hmm. that is one of the easiest ways to overspend. Let me throw some baby carrots in the cart. Yes, sounds like a great idea. Idea. Will you realistically go through them? Yeah. And I think the, the biggest, the sole biggest change for us was developing a meal plan. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, there was no plan. There wasn't anything conceptualized for how we will eat. And it was always a mix of me texting my husband or my husband texting me around 3.30 saying, what are we going to do for dinner? One of us would run to the store. It's always a 50 or $60 trip. Mm-hmm. Then we ended up with four different things of basil at one point because yeah. nobody's <laughs> checking to see what we have on hand. And that was another way that we were grossly overspending because mm-hmm. we didn't have a plan. So we're eating lunch out. I was picking up a Starbucks coffee every single day and it was mm-hmm. justified because I was getting the stars. So I was getting mm-hmm. a free one, right? Like we overspent so much because there was no plan in place. And I think just having a plan for your meals is the easiest and quickest way you can shave a ton of money off the budget. Yeah, I totally agree. I always say, I think everybody should have five dinners that they could cook without looking at a recipe. Like five things where they're like, I could grill this, and I could roast the potatoes at the same time and cut a, you know, cut some fruit and I could get that on the table without a recipe. Because I think when we lower the bar for how much effort we feel like that meal takes us, we're so much quicker to be willing to do it. And so I think I, I completely agree that having that known list of like out of all the recipes that I've looked at, out of all the things I've eaten, these are the go-tos that serve our family well, where most of the people at home will eat it. So you're not fighting that battle all the time can really reduce the decisions. Because like you said, if you know, you're know you texting each other at 3.30 and this is the first time that you're thinking about what's for dinner tonight and dinner is two hours away, it really does put you in a bind where you're like, well, we just like have to get what is convenient or we have to go to the store. And then inevitably, you don't only grab what's for dinner at the store. You're also like, well, this snack is out and this beverage would be nice. That's another thing we didn't even hit. We didn't have time to hit on. But if I reduce the number of times I walk into the store, I pretty much automatically reduce the amount I spend. So trying to squeeze it into these are the times I shop and these are the times I don't shop has really helped me to be able to reduce how much I spend overall instead of just having that knee-jerk reaction that like as soon as we're out of something, it means I have to run and go to the store, right? And it's like, could we go two more days without having that one item? Yes. Like we would be, no, no one, everybody's going to survive not having bread for a day and a half, you know, right? Like we'll be okay. But sometimes, like you said, without a plan, then everything feels urgent because you're like, well, I don't have I don't have any set day on the calendar that I'm planning to go grocery shopping. 
So since we're out of that thing, I might as well just go right now, where if we have a rhythm of I grocery shop on Saturdays or whatever it is, then if we run out of something on Thursday night, it doesn't become an emergency. It's like, oh, I'll just add that to the list. And on Saturday when I go, I'll grab it with everything else that can also dr drastically reduce how much we spend overall. That type of thinking really, it gets you creative too. You learn a lot of substitutions for things. Yeah. Like who knew you can substitute flaxseed for eggs? Like right. you never would have known that. Yeah. Or applesauce. I've learned that yeah. too. You can do yeah. unsweetened applesauce. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it brings out a lot of creativity as well. It does. I th yeah, I think it increases your confidence in the kitchen because you don't feel reliant on following the recipe exactly. You can read a recipe as like a guideline, but then you can be like, oh, well, I don't have that, but I do have this. And so it'll be fine. I think too, like, especially some of the smaller things that are like, add this sauce or add, you know, like being able to say that, like, if I don't have soy sauce, but I have Worcestershire, like it's, it's very similar kind of thing can also help with realizing that sometimes you can just skip an ingredient and the recipe will be fine, right? Instead of feeling like we have to do it exactly, otherwise it's all going to fall apart, I think is really helpful. Okay, so I could just keep talking and talking and talking, but we're already at an hour. So for people who are listening to this and they're like, I need more of that. I need more encouragement that I can do this, even if I live in a high cost of living area. Number one, when does your book come out and where can they find it? And also where can they find you on uh, Instagram in order to follow? My book is available now. It's on my website. Link to my website and everything's in my bio on my Grocery Getting Girl Instagram page. I'm also on TikTok, but definitely not as active on there. So check out my Instagram page. You can use the link to purchase the book. I've actually got the book on sale for $9.99 for the rest of the month. Amazing. Awesome. And we will have later this month in the Care Creates community, I'm going to do a live call talking to the members about grocery spending and meal planning. And we will be giving away three copies of Allie's book. So if you are in that community, make sure you're on that live because we're going to give it away as well. She's generously given us a few copies to get it out into a lot of hands. So go follow Allie at Grocery Getting Girl on Instagram, where you can find the links to all of her other stuff. Thanks so much, Allie. Thank you, Carly. Have a great day. Welcome to another segment of Not Worth Your Money, where... Carly and I will talk about something that may or may not be worth paying for. And sticking with our theme of food for this month and food spending, there was an interesting thing in the news a few weeks ago that I thought it would be worth talking about. Have you heard of the Wendy's surge pricing fiasco? No. <laughs> okay. So, Wendy's. On an earnings call in mid-February, the CEO announced that some of their goals for the next 18 to 24 months included experimenting with things like dynamic pricing. That was really the only reference to this thing, but everyone then kind of snowballed off of that and was freaking out that Wendy's was going to institute surge pricing in the same way that Uber has surge pricing, whereas mm -hmm. demand increases so do the prices mm -hmm. did they say at all what was dynamic about the prices like what would make it go up or down so in the following days the ceo really not uh, backpedaled, backpedaled. <laughs> not backpedaled on it but clarified what he was talking about because it was really just like an offhand comment and then it was kind of a media frenzy of like how is wendy's gonna be price gouging everybody when you know they get a, a baconator mm -hmm. for 13 bucks at lunchtime and there's also people talking about how they were going to be like stockpiling Frosties at 9 a.m. and then reselling them later in the day. <laughs> so the the news article, he he's clarified to say that they were only looking to experiment with offering discounts at low, low times, low times okay. of the day. Like a happy hour idea. Kind of like that. But being able to do it in real time with their new like drive through menu boards and things like that. So. It's not surge pricing. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be paying 15 mm -hmm. bucks for... Or maybe it was going to be, and then he saw the maybe, response. It didn't seem like that. But I thought it was just like an interesting kind of thought experiment. Like, yeah. does that make sense for food? Or, or what, what kind of, maybe a good question for you, what kinds of discounts during the day would actually entice you to go 
like say this is worth it to go through the drive through The big question mark in my mind is how would they get it, the word out there when the prices are coming down? Would it be a set time that's known? Because otherwise, who shows up in your drive through is who shows up in your drive through And if they show up expecting to pay the normal menu price, it doesn't really seem like it would work in the business's favor to offer that person who's already there planning to buy a discount. I would, I would assume it would be kind of an upsell, like you order your breakfast item. Breakfast is typically low mm-hmm. volume time of the day, especially for a restaurant like Wendy's. Yeah. Like, hey, normally a coffee is a dollar thirty nine, but you can get okay. uh, coffee for add ons or yeah. making it I a combo or something. Yeah, they would be yeah. Experiment. So what comes to mind for me is in January, Starbucks did every Thursday one drink is fifty percent off between noon and three which is probably a lower price time or a lower volume time for them. What was very interesting that I personally experienced and I was like, haha, their marketing got to me is that they did it every Thursday in January and then they just stopped. And then it got to February and I was like, it's Thursday. I got to go to Starbucks. <laughs> and, the, and the 50% drink deal was gone. And here I am paying full price. So I think of that, of like that hooked me for sure of a 50% off a drink. So a drink that I would normally get that was like typically $5.62 with tax was like three with the discount, which is substantial. So I wouldn't find myself swinging through Wendy's to save 50 cents. But if it's like substantial, then that would be enticing to me. You mentioned Starbucks, but is there a fast food or a restaurant like that? That if you knew they were offering discounts, you would be like, get in the car. (laughs) Chick-fil-A. Yeah. I think for me, Taco Bell is already the the value. It's bottomed out. It's bottomed out. Especially if they were offering discounts on literally any Mm. menu item. As I pulled up to the drive-thru, I'd be like, yep, give me that. Yeah, like if I was going through... Chick-fil-A and it was something like, you know, the large combo is the price of a medium combo at the time or something. I'd be all about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can't expect to see $20 Baconators at (laughs) noon from Wendy's, thankfully. Um, But I think the idea is kind of interesting. I understand it from a business perspective, too. I mean, that's the reality of things we've done before of like, If you have a low, typically low time in sales, either within a month or within a season or something, coming up with creative ways to repackage what you already offer at a price that is more appealing is, you know, that's something we have conversations about, too. I understand it from the perspective of dynamic pricing as a rename of a discount, Mm -hmm. not as like if more people are in the line, we're going to increase the price of your cheeseburger. (laughs) This is this is not an Uber situation. Yeah, no, no. Uh, Uber's taking advantage of the fact that if you need Uber, you need Uber. Yep. Regardless of what they charge. Yeah, exactly. And there's a limited number of drivers. Yeah. To go around. Versus, not like, I price. know that you have a hundred pounds of ground beef in your freezer, and you can make me a cheeseburger and just it's like fresh and never frozen. <laughs> no, yeah, not so in your fun. fridge. Excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> My uh, apologies to Wendy's. All right. This has been another episode of Not Worth Your Money. Thanks for listening to the Debt-Free Mom podcast. If you want to join me as a guest on the show, go to dfmpodcast.com. The Debt-Free Mom podcast is hosted by me, Carly Hill, and is produced, edited, and mixed by Kyle Hill. Music for this episode was written by Kyle Hill. Hit subscribe wherever you're listening to join in with every new episode as we grow our confidence and contentment in our personal finances. So this episode is apparently brought to you by Wendy's and Uber. Uber. So and Starbucks. And Starbucks. That's not true. <laughs> um, but it can be. But it can be. <laughs> hey, Dave, give us a call. <laughs> Who's Dave?